If advertising has taught us anything, it's that healthy kids need iron. Iron is the fuel that kickstarts the rapidly growing, energy hungry brain. We all need iron to keep our cells, bodies and minds working at peak capacity. However, for kids, is it possible that we're giving them too much of a good thing? My name is Dominic Hare and I'm an analytical neurochemist at the University of Technology, Sydney and the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. My research is examining the role iron plays in the development of Parkinson's disease and I'm studying if overloading the brain during the first few years of life is an additional risk factor for developing the disease as you grow old. My research has recently taken a very personal turn. My partner and I are expecting our first child, a little boy. And like all new parents, I'm super excited, but I'm also a little nervous, and I don't really know what to expect. I also want to know what the best thing we can possibly do for our child is to make sure that we give him the best possible start to life. Cereals, processed grains and flours often have iron added, something manufacturers are typically not shy about letting us know. In many countries, it's even mandatory, with policies dating back to the 1930s, designed with the intention of reducing anemia in the general population. Back then, it wasn't uncommon for ground-up iron filings, taken from disused railway tracks, to be tossed into batches of flour. Since the 1970s, even baby formula has been chock full of iron, a policy that was fantastic at reducing rates of anemia in children, and still is really important today for kids who need the additional iron boost. Now, however, we live in a time where the average Australian baby is chowing down on a whole range of different iron-enriched foods. Isn't it time for us to start thinking about what the long-term risks are for overloading the growing brain with too much? Our brains love iron, especially when they're growing. However, its eyes are slightly bigger than its stomach, and it's not very good at getting rid of the extra. On average, the amount of iron in our brain increases by about 30% over the course of our lives. And in Parkinson's disease, for some unknown reason, that increase is a bit higher, here in a part of the brain where we really don't want it to be. In this area, called the Substantia nigra pars compactor, cells that make the chemical dopamine slowly die, and too much iron has been caught red-handed. Why do I think overloading the growing brain with iron might be a bad thing? We tested this in mice by feeding them a high iron diet for the two weeks after they were born, and then left them to live a normal mouse's life. All of these mice started to show signs of Parkinson's disease as they grew old, and when we mixed in some of the genetic factors that are known to be linked to Parkinson's disease, the problem got even worse. When we look back at mortality rates from the World Health Organization, there's an alarming spike in Parkinson's disease deaths that start at around 50 to 60 years after iron fortification policies of grain became commonplace, and it's still growing today. Add in the infant formula policies, which weren't made law in many countries until the 1980s, we could be facing an explosion in Parkinson's disease rates in the middle of this century. The one exception is Japan, where the mortality rate has stayed pretty much the same. Yet in a range of other countries, where kids are not anemic, yet are fed lots of iron, rates seem to keep going up. The answer is in the humble tooth. Teeth, they grow like trees, leaving a distinctive physical layer almost every single day. Teeth pick up metals that are circulating around the body as well, and they deposit them with each layer, locking it up as an eternal record of past exposure, just like those rings in a tree. And the best thing, there are certain adult teeth that start forming at birth, so each and every one of us has a potential time capsule of our early life iron exposure sitting just here. We have the ability to look at iron in the living brain. And this gives us the opportunity to work with advanced imaging technology to get a picture of how iron in the brain and iron in our teeth, which traces all the way back to development, are linked. Even better, in people who are at risk of Parkinson's disease, we can see if the amount of iron in their brain and their teeth is a cause for concern. All life is a chemical reaction, so it stands to reason that all disease is the result of a chemical reaction as well. Exciting research around the world have been developing new therapeutic strategies that directly target iron in Parkinson's disease. However, we need to find new ways of identifying people in the early stages of the disease before clinical symptoms occur, and then intervene and stop those bad chemical reactions happening in the first place. And if along the way we get a chance to revisit what's best for our next generation, then all the better for us and this little guy.